Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to you all. My name is Brian Spears. I'm the president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association and you join us for a Zoom conversation uh, with me and the uh, Vice Chair of the Bar Council of England and Wales in a joint initiative between the Commonwealth Lawyers Association and the Bar Council where we want reflections and insights into how the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is impacting in your jurisdictions on the administration of justice and uh, if there are rule of law issues we hope that the conversation will uh, extract those from our discussion. Uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, set of uh, bar leaders and uh, senior practitioners that we have assembled and we're really looking forward to an excellent uh, conversation. Uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland, one of the uh, jurisdictions within the United Kingdom, and I can absolutely confirm the uh, devastating impact on uh, colleagues uh, both at the bar and doing transactional work that the lockdown has had in my jurisdiction. Uh, and co-hosting our discussion is uh, Derek Sweeting QC, who is the Vice Chair of the Bar Council of England and Wales. But Derek, perhaps you could both introduce yourself and then invite our participants to make their contributions about what is happening in their jurisdictions. Brian, thank you very much. And can I start by thanking the Commonwealth Lawyers Association for co-hosting this event with the Bar Council and also simply say hello and extend the best wishes of the Bar of England and Wales to all of our colleagues in the Asia region. Um, obviously, as Brian said, and I'm sure it's the same in the areas and, uh, where you work and practice, the COVID pandemic has had an enormous impact on the work of the courts. In this jurisdiction, they have really slowed to a halt and com ceased completely in some areas. And the work is really simply a trickle in some areas of the civil jurisdiction, although there have been attempts to keep things going. The hot topic of the moment really is that we have entered a phase where we are considering now how we restart the business of the courts and how we get things moving again. Uh, this morning on BBC Radio 4, both the Lord Chief Justice and the Lord Chancellor gave brief interviews in which they were addressing in particular how we restart jury trials. Of course, the challenges there are formidable because of the need to have social distancing and the difficulties of conducting a hearing other than having people in the room to do it. So that is under anxious consideration by the moment, at the moment by a working group, which is set up, including the Law Society, the Bar Council, and other constituent parties. On the civil side, technology has helped to some extent, but what we found after now four or five weeks of trying to get by with technology is that it isn't a complete answer. There are real limitations with what can be done, even though we are, of course, having a Zoom meeting today, it's not appropriate in every sort of hearing, and it brings with it significant limitations, and it taxes the, the, the patience of tribunals, and it's a very tiring way in which to conduct proceedings. So all of those things, are practical impediments, perhaps some of which were not anticipated at the outset, but they're necessary because we're trying to get back online. So that's a short summary really of where we are and the phase we're at in this jurisdiction. So can I ask Stephen really to give us some idea of what has been happening in Malaysia, whether you've been facing the same sorts of problems and whether you've come up with the same solutions. Uh, thank you, Derek. And, uh... Well, good afternoon, good evening, and even good morning to colleagues. Uh, well, Malaysia was one of the countries that were, I think, quite early hit of this. Um, and we've been under a movement control order, uh, somewhat like a lockdown, uh, since the mid of Mar mid March. And um, that is expected to go on until possibly uh, June. Um, what happened is, uh, uh, well, as in, mo in most jurisdictions, we were not prepared for this um, yeah, and uh, so practice initially came to almost a grinding halt in 
Asia, simply because you know uh, lawyers are not equally resourced uh, as they are in most part of the parts of the world, and, and uh, technology is not something that uh, has been embraced by uh, the profession as a whole, and indeed even by the courts. Uh, but since then, um, there have been much movement. We have realized that you know we can't be in a state of uh, animated suspension uh, in futuro, and so uh, moves have been made. And uh, what we have now is the, the courts are functioning. They are functioning uh, uh, in matters which are which can be handled uh, uh, by by way of virtual hearings, uh, not too contentious yet because we're moving to that level soon. Uh, we've got. Uh, uh, things being put in place, uh, moving towards more contentious matters. Uh, but uh, since, uh, well, since almost uh, after the, the movement con control order was imposed, uh, we, we started moving with some basic matters in the civil side. Criminal side, of course, whenever somebody is in, incarcerated by way of remand after an arrest or so, then there is certainly an urgency for those matters to be handled. And those have been taken up. But what we can't do yet is we can't move to the next level where you know you have uh, almost documentation where it may require witness evidence uh, where you know it's highly technical particularly in the appellate courts we're not ready for that yet uh, but uh, kudos to the judiciary here and, and the bar uh, they've been working at uh, putting prot protocols in place and if uh, all things fall in place i we expect uh, well this you know the next level to happen very soon uh, and that you know we could actually get into even taking on the more complex matters so the courts have actually been online with us by way of what we call e-reviews uh, to assess uh, the uh, ability of uh, lawyers to take on and carry on with matters and most of us have indicated that we're able to but the problem is then you have an opponent who may not be in the same position and then you know adjustments have to be made so we are at that stage we are at that stage where we are adjusting but, uh, but what we, we have in mind and what, what our focus is, that is that we should get, on, get moving as soon as possible. Because, you know, there is really no such thing as a line drawn on the sand insofar as this is concerned. We are not sure when this is going to end. And you can't tarry and just leave things be uh, and, and, you know, hope that it will come to some sort of an end and we, we switch to normality. I don't think that's going to happen. So in the Malaysian context, uh, efforts are being made. Uh, yes, we face the same challenges, I think, uh, which we're going to hear from all the jurisdictions. There's going to be a lot of changes that have to be put in place, a lot of adjustments that have to be made. But I, I think the profession in Malaysia and the world over is resilient. You know, we are, we are not, we are not uh, averse to change as much as we are criticized for being conservative more often than not. But I don't think we are averse to change. Most of us have embraced uh, technology. The rest are catching up. And I suppose it is now at a far more steeper learning curve that you need to catch up. But that, that, that's where we are, Derek. Thank you, Stephen. I think what struck me about that, uh, amongst the, the number of themes you touched on, was that not everybody is starting from the same place in terms of technology. And there has had to be rapid adjustments, catching up, as you referred to. To it so that we get back to the point we reach a point where everybody is able to participate and of course there is the worry that that won't be possible for everyone in society so i think with that particular thought in mind it would be worth asking santan in india which of course has problems of a completely different scale of this sort what the position is in that jurisdiction I think you may need to unmute. <laughs> yes. Sorry about it. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, as uh, Stephen was saying, uh, except for the scale, more or less the situation is the same here in India. Uh, the, the, once the pandemic started and then we, uh, the courts stopped functioning, uh, what happened was the to start with they started experimenting to deal with urgent cases uh, through virtual hearing but it has got its own limitations of various kinds 
So the higher courts in terms of high courts and the Supreme Court are using this technology of virtual hearing of urgent cases. When it comes to the lower courts, uh, it's totally a different scenario because urgent cases are being dealt with by high courts and Supreme Court, whereas in the lower court, it's a question of uh, matters that are remanded to those courts which they are dealing with today. So virtually, uh, because of this restriction, uh, the legal profession in terms of the bar, the members of the legal profession are almost cut away uh, as far as the uh, proceedings before the court are concerned. So essentially the problem here is, uh, unlike what is happening in UK, the lawyers do not come under essential service. Because of this restriction, uh, lawyers having free access to the court, to the court system, and trying to deal with the issues concerning their clients has become very, very limited. Hopefully, <clears throat> in the weeks to come, things might change a bit. But the major issues concerning uh, the, the community at large is, for example, you get to hear from the National Commission for Women about the increase in domestic violence. Similarly, when the pandemic started and lockdown started, the migrant workers from major cities were shifting back to their respective villages, towns, etc. The kind of problems which they face and it will really be what do you call it, the rule of issue, rule of law issues. Similarly, the homeless. And above all, what happens is the way the police is dealing with the people who are moving from place to place in this, in this time of uh, pandemic. So these are huge issues to dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis, unless and until the judiciary and the executive initiates an action for the cause of justice and then have a template to deal with these cases and open up, make lawyers essential service, it will be very difficult to deal with these situations. So that's the broad picture which is present in India, whether it is the higher courts or the lower courts. By and large, these are the things which we have to deal with unless and until the judiciary in the end and the executive, as I said earlier, they come to a talking table and then try to sort out what are the minimum judicial requirements with regard to prioritizing cases and dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, Santan, thank you so much for that. There are lots of themes there, many of which uh, certainly chime with me, the increase in domestic violence and so on. But the one that really struck me was the necessity for lawyers to be categorized as key or essential workers, which was a matter on which the Bar Council in this country had to lobby the government right at the outset. And thankfully, we obtained that status and it's made a big difference. It's continuing to make a difference in relation to things such as availability of testing and so on. So let's just ask Hassan in your near neighbor in Pakistan what the position is there and whether the response has been the same. Yes, hello and uh, thank you very much for um, taking me into this call. Uh, it's a pleasure speaking to you all. I think uh, Pakistan has a little uh, different uh, view from what I have so far heard. Our Chief Justice um, has actually championed the cause and he stated that um, the issues that Pakistani public faces are too important that the courts can be shut down. And uh, his, uh, you know, more or less words were that uh, people have confidence in the judiciary, so for it's important for the courts to be functioning. So uh, for Pakistan, the courts were not shut down generally, although uh, for regular work, there was no regular work going on. And the Supreme Court and the High Court took uh, appropriate measures for um, you know, ensuring 
that um, the virus is not caught by any staff, litigant or the lawyers. So all the typical and the usual uh, protective measures, they were adopted. Uh, staff of uh, 50 years and above were asked to stay at home and be available. Uh, the premises, some of the high court premises have mosques, so they were shut down so that people don't gather together. Uh, in terms of um, the working environment, all the urgent filings were allowed. So if you have an injunction matter, you can actually go to the court and have an urgent hearing or an urgent motion, and the court will pass appropriate orders. Uh, the Honorable Supreme Court, in fact, also uh, took up the Suomoto notice uh, on some issues because there were some media reports that uh, the regular uh, aid or support that the government was giving was not reaching uh, the proper people and there were some um, uh, demands from the doctors that uh, they were the, the protective equipment was not being provided so as part of the human rights protection issues uh, the Honorable Supreme Court five-member bench took up uh, the issue and they required the government to give them a presentation and tell them whether the measures were effective or not. Uh, one of the high courts also uh, passed orders uh, that um, uh, the prisoners who were locked down, they were living in very, you know, uh, um, short, uh, small cells. So the Supreme Court took up those issues also and issued the guidelines because one of the points that the Honorable to take a are with uh, the Honorable Supreme Court only. So that is to the effect, uh, extent of judiciary, but I think generally the legal profession is very badly affected uh, because obviously if you don't have any regular work going on, any regular new filings are not being done. And Pakistan, uh, the legal profession is not uh, used or other countries here, uh, the bulk majority of the lawyers, they are single practitioners. Uh, you will find very few large law firms or mid-sized law firms. So uh, particularly the, the younger generation, the, the younger lawyers who practice criminal laws, uh, they are more or less like, you know, working on a day-to-day -day basis. They would get you a bail and they would get the fee and have their expenses. So I think the situation has very badly affected. Uh, while the government has been working on a different basis, uh, providing relief to the people, because currently we have a lockdown uh, till uh, May 9th. And uh, the High Courts and the Supreme Court have also issued from time to time circulars and demands to ease uh, the administration of justice by extending the deadlines uh, by re referring to certain provisions in the Limitation Act and the General Clauses Act. So the general point of view is that so far as um, the, the deadlines are concerned, they stand extended till the time that the lockdown is over. And some of the IP offices have also issued similar guidelines. So generally the overall, I think dealing of the situation is very well balanced. So while our chief justice and the courts have ensured that the courts continue to function, they have been taking appropriate uh, protective measures. And yet, on the other hand, they have been trying to have an overview that the human right issues continue to be protected if necessary, and also to have a general oversee that uh, the people who really need help at this point of time from the public, they are not being hindered because of any political reasons. Hassan, that's a, that's very interesting. And a, a lot of takeaways in what you were telling us there. I thought the pragmatic response, quarantining or standing down court staff over 50, the pragmatic judicial uh, leadership, all those things come out. But I think the, the one that also struck me that you touched on is the impact of all this on the junior members of the profession. And obviously we're very concerned in this jurisdiction, as I'm sure everyone is, that we don't end up with serious structural damage to the legal system as a result of the profession not being able to survive, particularly at the junior end, the impact of COVID-19. Shall we go over to Gregory in Singapore to get the view from a rather different uh, jurisdiction, certainly in size? Thank you very much, uh, Derek. It's my, my privilege to share a little um, about the Singapore experience and I bring you greetings from Singapore and also our heartfelt um, you know, um, 
sympathies over the different situations that our countries are experiencing. Uh, we're dealing with um, a global pandemic. This is a tragedy of um, epic proportions. I know it's affected all our countries, our families, and our firms. Um, I think from the perspective of uh, the legal profession, and I'm going to touch only on the aspect relating to uh, the courts. Um, at um, the start of the discovery of this virus, which is uh, now called, of course, uh, COVID-19, but at that time called the Wuhan uh, virus or the novel coronavirus, at the start of um, Chinese New Year this year, uh, Singapore started seeing cases. Um, and so we were one of the earliest countries to be hit. And um, at present, our numbers are the highest in Southeast Asia, 16,000. Uh, part of the reason for that was despite uh, you know, all the intentionality and so on uh, to try and keep the numbers down, there was a, another wave of cases that came as a result of uh, what, what is known as imported cases, you know, students returning back from studying overseas and so on. And then there was a third wave involving migrant workers. Now that's just to paint the you know, sort of uh, social political context in which everything is happening. Fundamentally, it is really viewed as um, a public health issue. And so I think that's the starting point, you know, and I think we can't ignore the fact that there are losses of lives. Um, we can't ignore the fact that there are people suffering and there are people who are battling through this virus. So the question for us as a profession is really, um, how do we reduce the secondary impact of uh, this virus on our economic livelihood? Because we don't want secondary victims. Um, and so the story, in a sense, for us, as far as the courts were concerned, begins in early April, uh, because that was when um, our prime minister announced what was known as the circuit breaker measures. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a term that may be unique for us, uh, but some have described it as um, a lockdown with a, with a velvet glove, you know. Uh, so um, basically, the effect is largely the same. Um, you know, we are working from home. And um, the problem that we had, though, was that uh, legal services were not classified as essential services at the onset. Um, and so uh, my hands were full. Uh, we had to lobby. Uh, we relied on the UK president and uh, you know, also other jurisdictions to make a strong case to the government why legal services ought to be included. And uh, we were successful, in part, in our advocacy. Uh, and without getting into you know, all the details, as far as the courts were concerned, there was a recognition for what is known as essential and urgent uh, litigation matters. And so all uh, the courts are functioning uh, to provide um, you know, this uh, judicial uh, hearings for essential and urgent matters. And I'm just gonna give you a bit of a flavor of that uh, you know, by reference to um, what um, you know, we were able to have in Singapore. I'm just going to show you our registrar's um, circular, um, you know, and um, see if I can screen share this uh, for all of us, um, so that at least you can get the benefit of um, seeing this. Um, so this is uh, the profession-wide um, advisory that we issued, and one of the things that you know, we referenced was, and I'm just going to select this Supreme Court Registrar Circular Number Four of 2020. So this was what our Supreme Court rolled out: um, essential and urgent matters. And among uh, the considerations were uh, whether or not the matter was time sensitive, which of course applies to matters like injunctions. Uh, whether or not there is a legal requirement for the matter to be heard within any time frame. Uh, so we're talking about um, you know statutory, contractual. Uh, regulatory deadlines as well. Um, and it's not urgent just because the party subjectively feels so or the lawyers feel that they need to get it off you know, their list. Uh, and the counterbalance in having all of this uh, was the need for safe distancing measures as well. Uh, and so that was observed uh, throughout the whole process itself. Um, so what that meant at a practical level is that um, Lawyers were um, essentially participating in Zoom hearings. We're very, very uh, grateful that our judiciary are generally very tech savvy. Uh, the, the judges are all ready. We had been preparing the profession for this from two, 2017. 
and um, and so a lot of Zoom hearings take place. Um, and what that also uh, meant is um, law firms who are able to provide um, you know essential services, but who needed to go to their office in order to prepare, needed to observe what you see there and see safe distancing measures. Um, and so that meant um, you know no close proximity with their clients, with their colleagues, and so on. Um, you know, and that continues until today. You get an exemption. You you basically go into your office. You have a skeletal work presence, uh, sufficient distancing measures, and um, you know the idea is to really reduce the amount of people in the workforce. So that's just to give you a quick flavor of uh, what's um, been happening in Singapore, uh, and very just nice. to complete the picture. Yeah, just to complete one the, the picture very very swiftly. We've also had um, uh, a unique innovation in our state courts called um, asynchronous hearings, which, which essentially entail uh, the lawyers writing in by email to uh, put forward directions that they seek and the courts will bless it without hearing the parties. Um, one of the suggestions I put forward actually um, uh, was uh, from Hong Kong, where Justice Coleman in a case uh, in an unconventional ruling directed telephone hearings, taking a leaf from the arbitration world. Uh, and so we are considering these type of innovations. I'll just stop there because I don't want to take up too much time. Well, um, Gregory, absolutely fascinating. And I could um, easily have, have listened to a lot more about what's going on because a lot of it was very interesting. Uh, a number of things, of course. I think the ability of jurisdictions to cooperate in putting pressure on national governments in relation to things like key and essential worker status. And also the whole question of how you triage and prioritize work. And I think that's the first time we've had a screen share of how one jurisdiction has done it. We've got similar edicts and circulars from our judiciary as well. But again, a lot of scope, I would have thought, for one jurisdiction to learn from another. And if there is a template, why not share it and at least bring it to the attention of the judiciary in other jurisdictions as well. So with that in mind, should we go over to Bangladesh and ask uh, Mudasir to give us a, an update really on what's been happening there? If you can hear me. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank the Commonwealth Lawyers Association and the Bar Council for arranging this session. Uh, with regards to Bangladesh, uh, our situation is not very different from uh, India. Uh, we, our legal services have not been regarded as an essential services. So effectively, uh, Bangladesh has been in an effective lockdown from 26th of March, and it continues till 5th of May with the possibility of further lockdown in the future. So. Uh, our court's structure is effectively a Supreme Court with two divisions and the subordinate courts. And all the courts has been uh, under complete closure since 26th of March, uh, except for uh, chief judicial magistrates and chief metropolitan magistrates who are only conducting urgent cases. So uh, other than that, all the court proceedings are have stopped. Uh, we have not engaged in any virtual court proceedings as yet. Uh, in the absence of uh, direct legal framework, uh, we haven't had, uh, uh, unlike uh, UK, a uh, special statute enacted. Uh, in Bangladesh, we did not have a proclamation of emergency. Uh, so in these circumstances, there are differing opinions as to whether we have existing legal framework is sufficient to go forward with, uh, uh, with uh, virtual court proceedings. In my humble opinion, I think we have enough just to go ahead. Uh, and a uh, majority of my fellow members uh, of the bar also uh, favors that view. But notwithstanding that, uh, the courts have taken and the, uh, have certain steps, the Supreme Court authority. Uh, firstly, uh, they have uh, passed an administrative order extending all uh, bail orders, injunctions that was previously granted, status quo, etc. Uh, for a period of further two weeks from the date of reopening of the courts. So effectively trying to safeguard the legal position of the litigants prior to the closure. As regards new cases, uh, as I said, we still do not have in place a virtual court proceedings, but what we have gathered very recently, uh, possibly on the 26th of April, is uh, 
the Supreme Court, there is a Judicial Reform Committee, uh, which has recommended that uh, virtual court proceedings be initiated in a very small scale. Uh, and that could be done through the assistance of UNDP. Uh, uh, and they will render the technical assistance as well as certain trainings. And the committee has uh, requested the Honorable Chief Justice to take the necessary measures. And accordingly, the Supreme Court Authority has directed the committee as well as UNDP to put in place the measures within seven days. So uh, we hopefully in the coming week, we'll get to know where we stand with regard to the virtual uh, court proceedings. So uh, that's the uh, court proceedings state, uh, status in respect of Bangladesh. Uh, the, oh, in, in addition to this, uh, what we have also seen is the uh, prison authorities, in particular in relation to criminal matters, they have recommended that certain number of inmates be released, more than 4,000, and the government is also considering that given the nature of the offenses and the manner and the duration of their incarceration and etc. So that's also being considered. Uh, these are the small ad hoc steps that have been taken. But initially, uh, the bar members of the bar did welcome the closure. But now we are into the four more than a month almost have passed since the closure. So members of the bar is also now becoming very, very uh, anxious as to when we can get down to work. Given that our services is not considered essential services, our demand is there. The relevant stakeholders are talking. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to get that status. And even if not, the, uh, our, our judicial authorities, judicial leaders are sensitive to our demands. And they initially, uh, last week, they tried to open the courts in a very small scale, uh, like a, a vacation bench. Uh, Unfortunately, due to certain other pressures from the members of the bar who were very concerned about the spread of the virus, uh, they also suspended that. So in, in light of that, uh, the, our, our immediate uh, hope is that the virtual proceedings would be initiated very soon. Mudasar, uh, thank you. That's, um, that's uh, fascinating. Uh, just to, uh, I think, uh, echo something that Stephen said earlier, it, it does sound as if of all jurisdictions that we've heard from, you are in... The, the most state of suspended animation, if I can put it that way. And the real task in Bangladesh is to reanimate, even with some baby steps, um, as, as you've described. And it may be that some of what you've been hearing from other jurisdictions would be something that you could feed into the discussion, which is no doubt going on between the government and the judiciary about themes such as essential worker status and that sort of thing. So I'd like to bring Brian back in now and uh, ask him just to continue to facilitate the discussion. Okay, thank you, Derek. Uh, I find all of that fascinating, excellent contributions and a great insight into uh, this region. Uh, some common threads, and as Derek has pointed out, uh, some important differences. Uh, it does seem to me, Mudazir, that in Bangladesh there's going to be a, a great pressure on the IT profession to try and uh, respond to the requirements for uh, the virtual courts to be established. So I, I first of all wanted to turn to Melissa, who's been waiting patiently, and um, the use of technology, Melissa, was very much in evidence in your presidential round table event on Monday past, where you had some 80 colleagues from a number of jurisdictions assisting uh, the Law Society of Hong Kong, and perhaps when making your contribution about the impact on the administration of justice, you could also uh, widen it, taking into account your role as a, uh, a Law Society president, about the impact on members and what, uh, what your association has been able to do. Okay, okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think like um, Hong Kong is facing a very similar situation as other jurisdictions. But actually, um, um, the virus actually first hit Hong Kong like very early, like we, it happened in like uh, January. And the Hong Kong court is actually closed from um, late January. Um, it is in, um, like we call it a general a German period. Um, but of course, like um, Stephen, except like, um, uh, urgent and uh, essential court hearing are still um, are still being held. Um, for example, those cases with time bar or affecting civil liberties, they um, um, we can um, take a urgent 
application to court and they'll do it. But um, in, at the moment, the good news is um, actually our court will reopen um, in um, the 4th of May, which is only next Monday. So uh, because the, actually I must say the uh, COVID-19 cases, that's, um, we only have like just over 1,000 cases in Hong Kong, which we have a population of 7.4 million people. And I think for the death cases up to now, it's only four. So I think taking a cautious approach is very important. And I think we did quite well in, in, in terms of the health safety um, area. But now, um, in, I would say in the Hong Kong court, we can appreciate the importance of using more technology. So um, our court is like actually um, encouraged to use more like um, video conferencing um, to have hearings. And also um, for some hearing, uh, we ask our parties to agree to pay the disposal so um, they can sort of uh, get it done quickly to ensure access to justice is there. And we don't want to affect, uh, we want to maintain the rule of law. And um, as to technology, because um, even before the COVID-19, um, Hong Kong Law Society have been like pushing the judiciary to have more use of technology. And now we can all appreciate the importance of technology in all the um, hearing levels. Um, ac actually, but um, the court has to balance um, like the importance of um, privacy, um, confidentiality, and the use of technology. So they are taking a very cautious approach. And we have to sort of, um, ensure you, any use of um, um, video conferencing facility to do hearings and trial must be up to standard. Therefore, um, now the Law Society has been urging the government to assist lawyers. As you may appreciate, many of the law firms in Hong Kong, they are SME, they're small and medium firms. And as to the use of technology, um, they might, it is important for them to like equip themselves and upgrade their information technology system. But at this stage, people, there are a lot of calling from members that they are financially really badly affected. So we are very lucky because we've been urging the government have been lobbying. Just um, a week ago, the government put our um, special fund, uh, it's called the uh, Law Tech Fund of 35 million Hong Kong. I think in uh, British pounds, uh, no, in, um, it's around um, 3.5 million. So um, we are helping the small and medium law firm. Um, the one that has less than five practicing lawyer and also chambers. So um, each um, firm are entitled to get, to get up to um, 50,000 Hong Kong dollars, which is around 5,000 pounds. So I think it's very important um, that um, they can use the money to have more training and to buy the uh, proper equipment so that uh, we can, after this COVID-19, and we can equip the law firm to make sure they have good use of technology. And I think that is what um, the Law Society has been pushing, and we are arranging a lot of training for our members. And also, um, we have calling from members. Financially, they are really adversely affected. Therefore, um, we have done a number of measures. We have been like reducing our practicing certificate uh, fees, and also for um, the PIS, um, our insurance, our professional insurance. So we've been reducing that up to um, 80%, which is a very, very substantial amount. And now uh, we've been like um, helping members um, to write to their landlords. Hopefully they get a, um, a, some sort of rental reduce. And I think there's a lot of things like um, uh, we, we, we have to hear from our members, see what we can do for them. Uh, also, uh, we've been like writing to the legal aid department and also the Department of Justice because we have to ask for speedy settlement of the lawyer's fee. At the moment, we can see a lot of firms, they are really suffering. Cash flow is a problem. So we also arrange like a lot of bank loans so that can give them a special cheap rate to assist our members. Um, and also we are lucky after a lot of lobbying, in the Hong Kong government, they have um, 
anti-epidemic fund. So even for um, staff salary, so each person, each staff, they're entitled to um, $9,000 Hong Kong dollars a month subsidized, up to six months. So it's actually um, a quite a substantial amount. And I hope our um, members can um, find this help, uh, this use, um, those financial relief useful. Also, even surgical mask is an issue. Because like um, when we go to work, in Hong Kong it's not a total lockdown. So we still go to work, maybe like um, in, like in group A and group B, it's still going to work. And when we go to work, because people have to go to uh, go through like public transport, it's very important for them to have surgical masks. And law society has sourced a lot of masks. We give it out free of charge to our members and their firms. And uh, in order to like uh, boost the Hong Kong morale, Hong Kong Law Society, in that, together with ten professional bodies, including the the doctors, the dentists, the accountants, we have made a song to boost the Hong Kong morale. I think that's all, that's uh, so far we've been doing that. And we also stress the importance of communication. We've been doing a lot of um, uh, communication with members, including doing a survey. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Melissa. I think that's a, a first. Uh, we'll have to contemplate a, a CLA and Bar Council song, Derek, it would appear. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, seriously, that, that is a comprehensive suite of measures both recognizing the, uh, the need for health care and protection but also the, the economic impact and I suppose it's, um, it all depends just on the viability of each individual law society. Um, I'm conscious that Izad in Brunei Dar es Salaam has been waiting patiently to make a contribution and as president of your uh, law association can you maybe comment on the operation of the courts and how it is impacting on your members, Isaac. Um, yes, happy to. Uh, firstly, thank you um, to the Commonwealth Lawyers Association and the Bar, Bar Council uh, for organizing this. It's, it's been um, interesting and eye-opening for me um, to listen to the experience of the uh, bar leaders um, from overseas, um, I think firstly, I ought to uh, give you a little bit of background of, of how uh, COVID has affected Brunei um, before, before I can t talk to you about um, how we're dealing with it in court and, and perhaps about um, how, how lawyers are, are dealing with it. Um, we, we are a small jurisdiction of 450,000 people in, in the middle of Southeast Asia uh, with substantial air links. Um, we have had 138 um, recorded cases of COVID, uh, 124 discharged. Um, as of today, we've had zero new cases for the past 11 days. Um, the, the first case uh, was recorded on the 9th of March and um, which is six weeks ago, and the government um, had took um, pretty immediate action by um, closing schools within the first week, um, um, uh, uh, stopping Brunei citizens from leaving the country, um, banning mass, uh, mass congregations within uh, the first week as well, um, stopping inbound travel and stopping outbound travel. Uh, so, so the situation for us is is sort of semi lockdown. Um, uh, uh, most businesses still remain open. Um, shops and malls and markets uh, have, uh, are still open. Uh, government services in March were were suspended, but have slowly returned. Um, um, we, we are generally asked to practice social distancing, uh, so no, no gatherings, no home visits, no dinner parties. Um, uh, there's no strict obligation to, to stay at home, um, <clears throat> but, and uh, no restriction on, on movements. Um,
It is uh, at, at the moment the start of the fasting month, so so um, and and most people will observe the Ramadan. Um, the the expectation is that that things will remain quiet until um, end of May. Um, there will there will be no celebration of uh, Idul Fitri, um, and and schools will slowly will will reopen sort of the, at the end of May. So. Um, on, on, um, we've, so with a small population, it's been um, fairly, uh, fairly manageable. As, as far as the uh, experience in the courts have gone, um, we, within the first week, uh, uh, courts st started to encourage the use of video conferencing for, um, for uh, civil matters. We, we, we actually had a scare in the first week where, where there was a, it was found that there was transmission um, amongst lawyers um, at court um, in, the, in the first week after the 9th of March. Um, um, we, we ended up with two, two um, firms having to be quarantined for 14 days. Um, court was shut and, and uh, had to undergo deep clean. Um, uh, court then um, adjourned all non-essential civil cases to the end of March and, and later till mid-May. So uh, as of the end of March, um, courts is, uh, are still operating in the sense that uh, all um, uh, civil and criminal matters um, the, have, are adjourned. Uh, fresh criminal matters and urgent uh, civil applications, such as applications for injunctions, will still be heard. Um, civil matters in which counsel are involved will continue by way of video conference. Matters in which individual me uh, civil matters in which individual members of the public um, are required to attend can will will not will not proceed with video conference because because of the logistical and IT issues for for individual members. Um, filing is still permitted. Um, and in the month of April, criminal matters have proceeded with some criminal trials taking place under social distancing measures, uh, temperature checks, hand sanitizers, attendance logs to facilitate contact tracing. Um, a, a restriction on to ensure that only um, required individuals enter court buildings and, and social distancing measures. Um, um, so and, and other urgent criminal matters such, such, such as mitigation and bail applications are also heard. Um, civil matters where parties are represented have proceeded. Um, on, on video conference. Uh, no um, no uh, contested civil applications have proceeded with, so it's, it's really just uh, case management, pretrial conferences, and, and non-contentious matters before the registrar. Um, when when we, the courts were first uh, effectively shut down, um, all, all parties really had to fight to, to make their own way to, to find out um, what technology would work. Um, in, uh, in the early days, um, uh, court hearings uh, were being conducted by way of uh, WhatsApp video conference, but, but now um, Zoom and Skype is, is becoming more prevalent. The, the general experience is that parties have adapted well to the use of technology and the circumstances. The, the limitation is on the infrastructure and uh, Wi-Fi connectivity is not consistent for all parties. Um, and, and that is a challenge for having uh, contested or lengthy applications. Um, and um, we do look forward in the month of May to um, courts slowly opening up. But well, one of the issues that we have is uh, and it's, perhaps it's unique to Brunei is, is that the Court of Appeal is um, made up of ex-Hong Kong judges and, and they uh, fly into Brunei twice a year um, and 
given the current restrictions, we we I think we are going to have to find some way to have um, a court of appeal uh, session um, in in the next few months. Um, but we will have to see. Um, thank, thank you. As I'm sorry to cut across, I was I was wondering whether there whether there'll be a, a newly constituted court of appeal, and we might we might see the honourable Izad uh, sitting locally rather than flying in judges. But I did want um, to talk a little bit just about the, the rule of law and emergency powers situation. And Hassan, do you have any concerns about the type of emergency legislation that has been introduced in, in Pakistan? And do you have a really very brief comment that might just flag up or highlight those concerns? Uh, you see, uh, Sorry. We have a little uh, different situation because, uh, uh, as you may know, after the 18th Constitutional Amendment, a uh, lot of powers were um, given to the provinces. So we have a situation where uh, the emergency legislations are being brought by the provinces. So, for example, we have a new law in shape of an ordinance uh, in the province of Punjab, which deals with the pandemic where certain sanctions have been provided. So, you know, people moving out, uh, violating the lockdown. So they are being, um, you know, so they, the, the sanctions are that they can be arrested, people who are going to work. So the circulars and notifications are being issued by each provincial government, providing and saying what are the essential businesses and services that they are allowed to go out and what cannot happen. But of course, our prime minister has been coming on the national television and making general comments that um, <clears throat> uh, obviously you can't just put people behind the bars just because they have come out on the road. So for us, uh, what the government is saying, it's a, a very different situation because on one hand, you have to have a, a complete lockdown because this is what the specialists and the doctors are saying. Uh, the same government did eased up a little of a uh, bit of a lockdown uh, which resulted in increased numbers of um, uh, cases coming up although pakistan has been partly fortunate that we don't have that many cases we have about 15000 plus cases and about um, 3440 uh, uh, sorry 340 deaths so far but doctors have actually been coming on national press they have been holding press conferences and appealing to the people that please stay at home so i think as i said earlier on uh, while the legislations are there the rule of law issues may arise by virtue of the legislation but the courts are functioning and i think our chief justice and the supreme court and the high courts are cognizant of the fact but of course uh, we have to balance it out with the economic situation because uh, Pakistan being a very large country population of about 220 million people, uh, a greater majority of the people are daily wages who work on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's a big challenge. The government uh, Hassan, I'm sorry. We, we, uh, a lot of private organizations which are coming up. Thank you. So I would I would say that yes we have concerns of the rule of law but um, so far nothing major you know in terms of that you would really say that it's um, really a major issue which uh, has come up. Yes, thank you, Hassan. Uh, I, I just want a, a very brief comment before we wind up, and I'm afraid not everybody can be brought in. But uh, in this order, could I hear briefly from Melissa, then Gregory? And then Stephen, I'll, I'll bring you in from a sort of vice presidential overview on rule of law and emergency issues. And if the three of you who I've identified could be as uh, just concise as possible. Melissa, rule of law and emergency powers in Hong Kong. Um, because like um, Hong Kong, um, the emergency power right now is actually quite mild. We don't have social distancing and prohibit people uh, gathering more than four people in public places. I think the main thing is like any um, legislation, legislation regulation must be reasonable and proportionate. And I think at the moment um, for that, I think the general um, feeling in Hong Kong like for public gathering, not more than 
four people is reasonable. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Thank Gregory, you. Do you have a, any observations about um, emergency powers and the impact on rule of law and human rights? You are talking to me? I'm talking to you, Gregory, about yeah. your views from Singapore. Oh. Okay, sorry, I thought you were still talking to Melissa. Um, yeah, very quickly, um, I, I mean, we've had, um, I think similar to Hong Kong, very mild um, emergency powers, actually. A lot of it has been the subject of regulation. Uh, Parliament has been very swift in passing laws, uh, and uh, there have been temporary measures uh, that have been introduced, but all by way of uh, primary legislation as well as subsidiary legislation. Uh, and so that has also meant uh, very strict enforcement of laws involving sufficient distancing. For example, one individual who was supposed to be at home on a stay home notice uh, went to have a meal in a hawker center and has ended up being jailed uh, because of that. Now, of course, you can look at it at one level and say, well, is that really proportionate relative to, to other kinds of offenses? But viewed from the lens of public health, the risk of contact transmission and so on, it takes on a very different nuance. Uh, so our legislation has really come in in a very strong way and uh, people are, and lawyers are trying to interpret it, not just according to letter, but according to spirit. Okay. And by and large, we, we haven't had rule of law issues. Uh, thank you. Just before I turn to Stephen, uh, are any of our other participants really bursting to say something on this issue? If so, raise your hand, uh, but Mudazir, yes, come in, but very briefly, please. Um, Thanks for giving me the floor. Uh, with regard to the rule of law aspect, uh, the concern that the lawyers have been having in Bangladesh is uh, in the absence of the emergency proclamation or a specific statute, uh, we have we basically have no resort to uh, co constitutional court for enforcement of fundamental rights. Uh, by contrast, our constitution provides in Article 44 that enforcement of fundamental right is itself a right for the, uh, for the citizens. So uh, when we are unable to enforce that right, such closure of court proceedings is inconsistent with the mandate of our constitution. So hence, the, our urges is much more in having at least co courts, in particular constitutional courts, operating even in very small scale, which we hopefully would be in a position in a week's time. Thank you. I'm just watching Upul still be on the move. I hope he isn't on some sort of a movement restriction notice, but uh, you're making progress anyway, Upul. Uh, Stephen, can we get a, a sort of overview from you and a few reflections? And then the idea is that I'll turn to Derek to do some summing up, and then I'll, I'll bring this session to a close. But I would value hearing your overview, Stephen. Thank you, Brian. Um, on the first part, when we, we spoke about the different, or when we heard about the different experiences of the uh, various jurisdictions, I think it's very helpful uh, that, you know, um, uh, we have all reacted in some ways in, in a similar manner, but otherwise, tailored to the, to the local conditions that, that we face. So for example, uh, not all of us can rush to actually uh, uh, ask for our, our legal profession to be categorized as essential services. It really turns on the ecosystem that you are in. And, and because uh, health and safety is paramount, uh, you know, just giving the license to the legal profession to operate may actually cause more problems uh, to the profession uh, and certainly to members of the public. So we have reacted differently. So it's good to learn and it's, you know, to, to listen to the different approaches taken and, you know, we can take some out of it and some of it we may have to keep for another day, but that's good. And I, I hope we can collate this and it can come as some sort of a guideline from the CLA uh, and the Bar of United Wales that we can all uh, latch on to. So that's the first thing in terms of the general approach. Now on the rule of law challenges, now the problem I think all nations face is that they are they are dealing with an unseen, unknown, almost unknown enemy, and you you don't really know how to to deal with it yet. So laws that have come into place appear to be first very wide, secondly rather ambiguous, 
certainly placing a lot of power in the hands of the authorities. All for, well, uh, apparently good reasons, but in application, you have the problem. And, and that problem is, uh, I think, manifested, or you see that problem taken up and dealt with, with the CLA issuing a statement. The CLA has issued a statement about uh, how you need to be vigilant. Law Asia has issued a statement. And many local bars, the national bars, have issued statements uh, chastising the authorities, asking the authorities to be careful in the way they conduct themselves. And that's correct. That's absolutely correct because this is the time when your rule of law thermometer must be in action. You must have that as a check and balance. If you're not careful, then you will have, in the, in the name of health and safety, disparity of treatment of persons uh, violators, disparity of sentencing, if you like. So if, if you take Malaysia, we are operating under a movement control order, a subsidy legislation under a parent act, which is the Prevention and Control of Infectious Disease Act, broadly cast with wide powers. What has, it, what has happened in that? You have some persons, uh, well, two, two categories of persons committing the same sort of violation, but getting different sentences. And violators being imprisoned. Now, when you are in prison as a measure of deterrence, now it may, of course, strike a good chord in society, but the person actually may well go into a general prison population. And you are then creating, that's a recipe for disaster, mind you, you are creating a possibility of further infection within a very close kept uh, population. And so then you talk in terms of you keep them in separate locations, but it's imprisonment. All right. So you, on the one hand, you want to deter this. You want, to, to, you want a, a sense of deterrence so people will obey and, and not violate these orders. But the other hand, you have this heavy handedness. It's what I think uh, Melissa mentioned. You know, there must be a sense of reasonableness or rationality in what you do and certainly proportionality. Now, the balance is not easily struck. The balance is not easily struck. And you know what we should do is we actually should learn from each other as to how we deal with this how we can manage that balance without really making the situation worse and the rule of law suffering. I mean, I, I can go on further and, you know, very quickly say that, you know, other, other aspects of the rule of law could also be challenged because we are so diverted in our attention to this major problem that if you, you could have uh, uh, dishonest uh, persons within authority who are appropriating powers and doing all sorts of things. Now, that's another thing altogether. So the bottom line is this, is vigilance. The rule of law thermometer must be active at this time. All bar associations, indeed all lawyers, must be, must be prepared to speak up. And don't let COVID-19 be used as an excuse for rule of law violations. Thank you, Stephen. That's a very uh, powerful and effective summary. And could I invite Derek then to um, uh, really close off before handing back to me to actually close off? Brian, thank you. Yes, just two points from me, really. One, to echo the point that Stephen has just made, that vigilance is our job. These emergency times call for draconian legislation, but that's one of the reasons why the work we do is essential, and why indeed we are essential workers. But making sure that the checks and the balances remain in place is going to be our task going forward as well as we come out of this. One of the things we've done in this jurisdiction is to lobby for and obtain six monthly reviews of the legislation. The original proposal would have, it, have had it in place for much longer. The second point is that a lot of these problems are novel and it's clear that nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. And I've sat here listening with interest and taking notes, I can tell you, about the things which are being done around the world to deal with the common problems that we have, albeit that the context is often different. And thirdly, I'd just like to say this, that I have very fond memories of many of the places that you are all talking from, holidays and business trips and so on. And in these times of restricted movement, it has been atomic to travel with you in spirit to where you are and to recast some of those memories at a time when, of course, we're all feeling a little bit stir crazy because of the restrictions. So it has been a delight. And thank you very much. Well, thank you for those uh, comments, Derek. I, I echo the 
views that this is an important discussion that we have learned very uh, much from your experiences that you have also generously contributed. You have uh, shared openly, you have given us your time, and I think that we will uh, make as much of this as we possibly can between the Bar Council and the CLA. Uh, the, the next of these discussions will take place with the uh, Caribbean members of the Commonwealth, and we have lined up uh, another, I was going to say stellar cast, but I think actually this cast of our Asia region has been particularly brilliant, and I thank you all for uh, being uh, hurried along a little bit, contributing so brilliantly. Uh, Upal, I think you have arrived in, at your destination, which is great, and uh, uh, my experience of a, a tuk-tuk in Colombo when I was there in November would not have made me as relaxed at the end of the journey as you are appearing uh, because of the, the hazards of, of road traffic navigation. But I'm sorry to bring matters to a close. It's been lovely to, to see you all. Uh, I hope that you and your families and your colleagues uh, remain safe. And I hope that the judicial system continues to function and respond in a flexible way and that our cases, our clients can be represented and that our rule of law issues and our duties as lawyers can be maintained.